Japanese engineers may be able to start removing fuel from the reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi plant earlier than previously expected. Officials of the government and the plant's operator say they want to speed up the process. They've drafted a new roadmap for getting the work done. The officials jointly released a revised timetable for decommissioning the four reactors damaged in the earthquake and tsunami two years ago. The plan covers various scenarios for removing the melted nuclear fuel from three of them. It calls for work to begin on separate dates for each of the reactors. Engineers will start with the number one and two reactors in the year 2020 at the earliest. That's 18 months sooner than the previous plan. But work on reactor number two could be delayed until 2024. It'll depend on how quickly engineers can decontaminate the reactor building. Radiation levels remain high at the plant. Engineers now depend on remote-controlled robots to work inside the reactors. The timetable is subject to change depending on whether they can develop new technology. Now, officials have been facing very challenging situations. In September, a crane operator accidentally knocked a steel beam into a spent fuel pool in the building of Reactor 3. The worker was removing debris at the time. A power blackout in March caused the suspension of cooling systems for spent fuel over the course of nearly 30 hours. Officials believe a rat caused a short circuit in an electric switchboard. Contaminated water leaks are another problem. Utility officials say groundwater is seeping into the buildings at a rate of 400 tons per day. The more time it takes to decommission the reactors, the more risks engineers will be exposed to. They need to revise the roadmap as they go to deal with the specific difficulties they encounter and prepare backup plans. The biggest challenge will be to remove melted fuel from the crippled reactors. A meltdown occurred in 1979 at the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in the United States, but the melted fuel remained within the reactor's core. The meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi caused the fuel to eat through the core of the reactors. Engineers still don't know the exact location of the melted fuel. Workers at Fukushima Daiichi have completed another project in their long-running effort to deal with decontaminated water. In April, they found a number of leaks in the underground pools at the nuclear plant, but they finished transferring the water from those pools to tanks above ground. Officials at Tokyo Electric Power Company decided to stop using all seven pools after learning of the leaks. They decided to move about 24,000 tons of water to tanks above ground. Crews started transferring it in mid-April. TEPCO officials plan to store all of the water above ground, but they have to deal with more and more contaminated water every day. Officials plan to install more tanks, but space is limited. They had hoped to release uh, groundwater into the ocean before it seeps into the reactor buildings. But they're finding it difficult to reach an agreement with local fishermen who fear what that might do to the waters offshore. Schools all around the plant were contaminated with radiation after the nuclear accident two years ago. Officials with Japan's Environment Ministry say many of them have now been decontaminated. Government officials conducted a survey in 58 municipalities in eastern Japan. They did not include areas in Fukushima Prefecture. Almost 1,600 schools were included in the survey. Municipal officials report 98% of them have been cleaned up. The survey also covered housing in the region. Respondents reported that only 25% of housing units have been decontaminated. That's almost unchanged since the survey conducted last December. But ministry officials say more houses have been added to the list of those that needed to be cleaned up. They say they intend to speed up the decontamination operation. All 6,000 residents of Itate village in Fukushima prefecture were forced to evacuate their homes two years ago after the nuclear crisis. They still can't move back because of high radiation levels. Many are working to resume their work as farmers after the levels drop. Some have planted rice seedlings in a decontaminated paddy to see if the crop will be affected. Now the paddy is in the Nakadoro district, which has the highest radiation levels in the village. 
In August, workers removed five centimeters of topsoil from the paddy. Levels of radioactive cesium in the remaining soil reportedly fell more than 90 percent. Village officials plan to harvest the rice in September. They will dispose of it after analyzing how much cesium it contains. It's tough and sad for us to throw our crops away. But we are looking forward to positive results from the test, as that will help bring us a bright future. An Itate official says he hopes the result of the test planting will lead to an early return of the villagers. Many Fukushima residents are still not allowed back into areas of high radiation. But now Japanese Environment Ministry personnel are planning a trial cleanup. Government officials designated certain areas in seven Fukushima municipalities as no-go zones. They previously delayed major cleanup operations for fear of radiation exposure. But in August, they'll start cleaning up the town of Namie. They'll work on residential areas, roads and fields. Then in September, they'll start work at kindergartens and hospitals in Futaba town. The officials plan to evaluate the effectiveness of their cleanup procedures and publish the results. Regulators have been checking into the safety of the only operating nuclear plant in Japan. They've endorsed a risk assessment by the operator of the OE complex before stricter guidelines come into effect in July. The regulators asked the people at Kansai Electric to study what might happen if three active faults near the plant move simultaneously. Executives from the utility initially argued that such a scenario was unlikely, but they later agreed to assess the risks. Engineers calculated how much the reactor buildings would shake and what kind of tsunami they could expect. They said the reactors are almost six meters higher than any waves would be. Regulators have endorsed most of Kansai Electric's assessments. They plan to carry out on-site inspections before deciding whether the plant can stay online. Japanese scientists say global warming is likely to threaten more and more people around the world. They say rising temperatures could lead to extreme flooding in Asia, Africa and South America. Scientists from the University of Tokyo and the Tokyo Institute of Technology came up with a forecast based on data from the UN. They say if global temperatures continue to rise, large floods will become more common in Asia in the second half of the century. They say floods that used to occur once every 100 years could happen every 5 to 50 years. The risk would double in Africa, South America and northeastern Eurasia. The researchers say a two-degree rise in global temperatures would put about 30 million people at risk. A rise of four degrees will affect about 60 million people. Now we can add the risk of flooding when we talk about setting targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think our study is important. Hirabayashi said countries should start taking measures to deal with the threat of rising waters. Floodgates protect people from tsunamis and floods. Up until now, humans closed the gates, either by hand or remote control. But following the March 2011 disaster, people have questioned the effectiveness of these gates. Now, engineers in Japan have come up with a new kind that might work better in a disaster. NHK World's Akane Nakajima has the report. Researchers have developed a new kind of floodgate. It is activated by flowing water. No manual power is needed. Some conventional seawalls have floodgates that blocks water, but lets people and vehicles through. In emergencies, most gates have to be closed manually or by electricity. During the disaster of March 2011, power failed everywhere. Volunteer firefighters tried closing the gates, but in the effort, more than 60 died. This drew attention to a problem within the system. This is a demonstration facility of a new floodgate. This demonstration model uses the force of the wave to shut it without using any electricity or manpower. The main component to this floodgate system is the door. The outside is stainless steel. The gate normally lies flat. 
It can withstand the weight of people or vehicles. The body of the gate has a special material that is strong but light enough to float. If the door is buoyant, it floats, but it cannot stop the water. With this new floodgate, two hinges fasten the door to the ground. When the water makes contact, it pushes the door up. The gate has to be light enough to float on water, but strong enough so as not to collapse. The gate costs 10 to 20 percent less to build than a conventional one. That's because its construction is simple and it doesn't need a motor. As well, not much maintenance is needed. Hajime Mase specializes in disaster prevention research at Kyoto University. He is one of the people who developed the new floodgate. He says it could be used for a variety of purposes. We are now facing a global warming, and the global warming makes uh, storm surges and waves uh, bigger and bigger. That means uh, overflow from the sea walls and uh, overtopping over a uh, sea wall is make severe. At that place, a uh, floodgate is very useful to set at the entrance of the underground shopping mall or something. Using this new method, firefighters no longer have to risk their lives to close the floodgates. They can focus on helping people, as well as themselves. This advancement may save many lives.